so yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we are really excited to be hosting this session, uh, session on pay for impact. So my name is Rebecca Kaduru. I'm the managing director for Solidaridad in North America. Um, and Solidaridad is a global nonprofit network organization that works uh, to promote sustainable and ethical supply chains globally. Uh, one of our um, core goals moving into the next five year period planning period we have for ourselves is really focusing on building econ uh, an economy and sustainability solutions that, that work for everyone, particularly those um, at the bottom of the pyramid. And so we're really excited to host the session on pay for impact. Um, I'm going to give uh, an introduction to our speakers and then I'm going to just run through a brief of how the session structure is going to work. Um, so we have from Solidaridad uh, in, um, from our Brazil office, we have Monique Vani, who is our um, manager, our global digital innovation manager. We have Frederick Clausen, who leads our impact investment team um, out of the Netherlands. And then we have Hammond Mensa, who leads, leads our impact investment team out of our West Africa office in Ghana. And then we also have Ani Patton Powers, um, who is joining us from the United Kingdom, though uh, you're originally from South Africa, if I, I think I've got it correctly. And then um, we have Kareem Harji, um, who is also joining us uh, from uh, Oxford University as well. So we're really excited to have everyone here. Um, our session is going to look like this. We're going to run through a test case of um, what a potential impact um, pay for impact scenario looks like. And then we will break up randomly into four breakout sessions that will uh, represent four stakeholders in the process. So farmers, investors, verifiers, and outcome payers. And then we will come back together and share those learnings. So we're excited for this to be an interactive workshop. Um, and I am going to hand this over to my colleague, uh, Hammond, who's gonna walk through a little bit more on what pay for impact means and the test case that we are going to be doing in this session. So thank you everyone for joining. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, Rebecca, and uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, the problem that we are trying to solve uh, at the moment uh, is that uh, according to data available at the, the World Bank, only 2% of the 391 billion dollars uh, in climate finance go to, to farmers. And there are two challenges that we see. Um, one is uh, that farmers lack the technical uh, knowledge to adopt uh, resilient behaviors. And in even situations where they have the technical know-how or the financing or the inputs to adopt uh, such behaviors, uh, measuring the impact of their actions in a manner that is transparent uh, and cost effective uh, is an issue. Uh, and therefore, we haven't seen the finding uh, from fire climate finance flow uh, into, uh, into production or into food production. Now, why it is important that we solve this problem uh, is that uh, smallholder farmers or farmers in general are amongst uh, some of the most uh, vulnerable uh, to climate change. Uh, farmers are also instrumental in safeguarding the, uh, the food chain for a vast majority of the global population. Uh, and then uh, agriculture also has a capacity to play a crucial role in, uh, in, in carbon sequestration. So it is important that uh, the problem that we have identified uh, is resolved. So um, we have looked at the structure that you see on your screen currently, uh, which we believe would promote the flow of climate finance uh, into uh, the farming space. And the actors that we have in there are the, the investors. And these are investors who are looking for uh, ways of expanding their 
ag sector portfolio in a cost-effective manner. Um, there are also, of course, the impact makers, uh, which are the, the farmers and also service providers to farmers uh, who are looking for financing uh, for their operations. Uh, there are corporates, both public and private, uh, who are interested in uh, paying for climate or positive climate outcomes. And of course, the independent uh, verifiers who play the role in ensuring that uh, predefined outcomes uh, are verified and made available to all the actors within the chain so they can take decisions uh, with respect to uh, the flow of financing from investors to the, the impact makers. Next slide, please. So um, in terms of what we have done so far, uh, this is uh, an aggregation of a, a number of partnerships and platforms that we have within Solidaridad that has culminated uh, in, the, in this project known as Farm Impact. And the main aim of this platform is to solve the difficulties that we have in measuring adaptation impacts, because uh, as uh, was said earlier, it is a hindrance to uh, investment into climate smart agriculture. So um, what has been done on this platform is that we have developed a cost-effective or lean way of assessing climate risk or climate vulnerability. Uh, once the assessment is done, the output from that assessment is used to generate a pathway towards farm level resilience for smallholder farmers. Uh, smallholder farmers who adopt or implement this plan uh, generate tokens that they can monetize to do various things. And as part of this platform also, we have created opportunity or a platform for um, farmers who have the tokens to be able to connect to investors who are interested in purchasing uh, these tokens. Farmers can now use the incomes that they make from uh, selling these tokens uh, to, to pay for inputs or reduce the cost of borrowing uh, for investment into uh, their farms. Next slide, please. So these are the key actors that we are looking at. The impact makers specifically for um, this session, we are looking at cocoa farmers in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire who currently live on uh, less than $1 a day, uh, even though they produce about 60% of the global cocoa output. Uh, and also SMEs who provide services to smallholder farmers who are not able to do that on their own, uh, either because they, they lack the money to do that or they lack the manpower to provide the services on their own. And then for the investors, currently there is a, a demand for about $240 billion for farm level investments, uh, which has not been met at the moment. And the reason why the funding is not, is not flowing is because value chains in the cocoa space are not tight enough, they are pretty loose. Uh, farm operations are not as professionalized as they ought to be to be able to attract the kind of investment that is, that is needed. Uh, traditional verification methods are prohibitive uh, because it relies largely on boots on the ground. And then uh, new technologies um, that have come up also do not have uh, ground access and therefore deploying that uh, have a few gaps that have to be uh, addressed. And then of course the auditing system also lack uh, continuous improvement mechanisms. Outcome payers are public and private funders who are interested in uh, paying for climate outcomes at a smallholder um, level. Next slide. So um, I would hand over to my colleague, Monique Vani, who will take us through uh, the rules for the breakout sessions. Thank you. Um, hi, so um, I think that we should um, sit down with our individual stakeholders, uh, however it is that we are going to be distributed, and have a little bit of a look at what motivates them, who they are, what they need, and what they are looking for, and, and see what that means in terms of designing such a financial instrument. Um, what are the specific needs and what are the specific processes and aspects of this product that each of these stakeholders is going to need? Um, each of the leaders of the stake of the groups uh, will take you through. 
And then that will let us come back to the session with everyone together and uh, understand what are the building blocks of a solution that meets all of these needs? How do we construct something uh, that is a meeting point for all of these often conflicting interests? And uh, how do we build something that will bring them together? Uh, I would like us to pay special attention to uh, some specific issues which have to do with uh, making these things uh, efficient and scalable, but also ethical, uh, especially relating to uh, privacy and, and uh, security of data uh, of farmers, which is often an issue when we are trying to uh, verify on-farm practices. Um, I think that is it for the moment. Uh, should we break out? Sure, just finishing off of the... It's gonna spend a couple of minutes now um, with... Um, it's okay, Libby, I got it, I'll just share my screen here. Um, a couple of minutes now um, with each of the, um, each of the rooms um, to report back on their, on their discussions. And then um, I'll try and kind of pull it all together um, for us um, to finish. So can we start with the farmers, Hammond? Tell us, tell us how you guys, how your discussion went and what you, um, what you have come up with here. Uh, discussions uh, went very good. Uh, we were fortunate to have someone who had worked in the cocoa landscape in Sahuri, also in Ghana. No uh, way! We had we had someone from USAID in ours. I mean, I, uh, I did this totally randomly, and we had some, <laughs> some great allocation. Yeah, that was one of those fortuitous moments. So, so that was good. And um, in terms of discussions or what what what, what were what were proposed, um, there was a proposal to look at the minerals that sits underneath the, the farmer's field. Um, currently, there's a lot of illegal mining happening in the cocoa landscape. Uh, and, and that is a big source of worry for, for cocoa farmers. So if farmers have the rights to the mineral that sits underneath their farm, I believe that's, that's, uh, that will go a long way in, in, in stemming that. Land rights, um, and let me take that together with tree rights. Land rights, tree rights, big issue in Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, situations where farmers are tenants, it becomes very tough or almost impossible for them to uh, implement good agronomic practices, especially when it comes to rehabilitating or renovating their farms. Because as soon as you, you, you remove the old trees, the land reverts back to the, to the landlord. So that's a big issue that ought to be looked at. Uh, cash incentives for, to prevent deforestation. Deforestation is another big issue in a cocoa landscape, it threatens trade development. And so uh, we also uh, came up with a proposal to look at cash incentives to prevent deforestation. And then of course there was a, a interactive voice response or what was referred to as a talking book for delivering a good agronomic advisory services to cocoa farmers. In terms of desired impact. Wait, uh, sorry, I'm, in. I'm gonna stop you from going through each bullet point. Tell us what your solution yes, looks like in the middle. Uh, so this Great, 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 great. So the solution is a digital tool that uh, collects data on the adaptation uh, behavior of, of farmers uh, so they can generate points and, 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 and trade those points for, uh, for money so they can invest those monies in, uh, in uh, farm level productivity activities. Uh, one thing that also came up uh, was to ensure that there are quick wins uh, to encourage continuous investment. We don't wait until the end. Uh, before farmers begin to benefit from from this solution, so uh, that was um, the outcome of our conversation. Excellent. Is there anyone else that was um, in the farmer discussion um, that wants to add anything? You all did um, Hammond speak for um, for for everyone? You all got all good. I guess. <laughs> All right, excellent, great. It, it was perfect. <laughs> perfect, wow, that's impressive then. All right, Frederick. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Good. Yep. Investors. Um, yeah, we definitely had the best brains at the table uh, and I'm, I'm really grateful for my fellow companions in the, in the, in the, in the breakout uh, room. Without them, uh, we would never have this brand new product at the table. 
which is, I think, a uh, crushing, eye-striking new solution that will completely disrupt the whole impact investment industry. So, uh, yeah, bear with me. Um, the bar is being set very high, I know, for the other groups. Um, but the product that we're looking at is that uh, we, we want to make sure that blended capital comes in when impact is being verified. And yeah. only, you know, the current system is that blended cap capital comes in uh, in a lump sum often uh, at fund level to actually take the first losses eh? or, you know, um, make sure that the returns are, uh, are better, you know, given the risk. Yeah. And now we want to change that system that uh, instead of putting it all at once at the table, what all donors do, we only do that when impact is being verified. Uh, so that, that is quite a change for uh, investors mm -hmm. because at, at that moment, you know, investors really need to prove uh, that the impact that they achieve by their capital allocations is real. Yeah. So, and then of course, you know, we make use of the new technology with uh, verified impact and uh, we will, you know, hear more about the other subgroup, you know, how that uh, will play out. But that's actually the, the, the basic thing. And, uh, you know, we were so happy and champagne was flowing all over the tables uh, until the moment that we start challenging ourselves. Uh, which was actually one thing we should not have done because then the, basic, <laughs> the big questions came up. And one of these big questions was like, what uh, happens when unintended side effects occur? You know, this system is so rigorous. It actually measures, you know, exactly what's happening on the ground. But what, what happens when, you know, you know, farmers plant trees that use a lot of water? Yeah? And then you're, you're actually overshooting your actually goal. So that, that became a real question. So how can pay for impact avoid these unintended side effects? And that's what we hope that will come out of, uh, of one of the next groups, a solution. But that's it, uh, Oni. Yeah, it was an honor. Very interesting. Um, did, Frederick, did Frederick cover everything? Anything else anyone wants to add from the investor group? Okay. All right. So the verifiers, we're all talking about all of this impact that we want to have. Um, how do we actually make sure it's real? Yeah, maybe I'll start Ani and then I'll let Monique jump in. Uh, so, so we had some really good uh, discussions. I think we were just getting into the solution when time ran out, but uh, we think we have a good number of things that maybe respond to what people have said so far. So just in terms of the kinds of things we, we discussed, Initially, we, we talk quite a bit around also making sure that it includes, you know, farmer perspectives, provides value to farmers, and then there's different ways in which it could provide value to make it easy for farmers, et cetera. But when we think about the, the kind of complexity of this ecosystem, there are a number of almost like decisions or choices that we have to think about, because one of them is, you know, who does verification provide value to? Um, and so that's one of the questions that we'll, we'll come back to shortly. We also talked about some of the trade-offs between, for example, costs and accuracy, um, mm. in that we can get a lot of data, we can get incredibly precise data, um, but it also costs money, even if we're using technology to be able to do this. So, you know, at some point that, that becomes a, a really important piece when we think about how we're engaging um, on the ground. Uh, a number of people also just, you know, made this point around the relationships that you need on the ground to do this well, to be able to enhance your credibility and trust, and that both in this sector, as well as maybe in some of these uh, regions, the assumption is that maybe this just doesn't exist on its own. So both the verifier, as well as the kind of approach you take, needs to be able to enhance the credibility and trust as a result of the process. Um, and it should strengthen uh, and contribute to building some of that social capital within the community. Um, we talked a little bit about incentives that are being tested, for example, in other areas we know nudges um, and those kinds of incentives can be helpful. There's also monetary incentives that can be used. And then we spent a bit of time on thinking about some of the ethical principles. And, and the big questions are really, you know, whose data, who owns the data, how do we think about use and ownership in ways that actually protect um, farmers in, in this case? And, and again, 
enhance credibility and trust in the process. And it was important, I think pretty much every um, comment was that it should be community driven. Um, and so Monique, maybe I'll hand it over to you to fill in a couple of other points and, and talk about the components of the solution. Yeah, so I think um, verification is where everything, uh, all, all the complications of Frederick's uh, session kind of <laughs> fall. And uh, verification is something that then needs to be negotiated and, and the trade-offs in order to have trust need to be clarified and systematized. I think that's the best that we can achieve. I mean, we, we can't expect to do away with complexity, but I think we need to identify and, and, and map the pros and cons as we go along. So for example, we were talking about, if you're talking about cost versus accuracy, for example, I don't think there's going to be one solution. I think dif different investors are going to have different comfort levels of, of what they're looking for. And what you have to be able to offer is options along that gradient and technology helps us do that, right? So you can say, oh, I want everything to be, you know, third party verified, or I'm, I'm happy with some proxy indicators and some spot checking, and you're gonna have to build a lever along that verification gradient uh, uh, to meet different investors' needs. And, and this is why, having things that work on, on platform models where different competing interests uh, 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 can work together is also crucial so that you can have these different layers and these different orientations working together. Another thing that I find key is we cannot uh, uh, go into positions where we shy away from uh, real community impact in adaptation because it's complicated to verify we need to, to move past this deadlock and, and start working with what we have and let the advances of AI and other things uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 take away the complexity with time uh, because or else we're going to end up with climate finance that when it goes to farmers continues to go to large mitigation schemes uh, for large farmers and what smallholders need really is adaptation funding. So we need to uh, find the, the the levers of simplification and and get into it because if if we shy away from complexity then the farmers will not receive the investment so we have to parameterize and move ahead. I mean that my God I thought it was like a masterclass in like impact verification. I feel like I should have been taking notes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, excellent. So then our last piece um, was around the outcome payer. I told my group we had the hardest one, but that's what you always say as a teacher to any time, any, to any group. So, um, but um, I'm sorry to dissuade all of you from, I know you actually believed me. So we also had an amazing um, group because um, we actually um, had someone from a DFI um, around the table. And so Zach was able to, um, to, to guide us as we, were, um, as we were looking at what would be important to the outcome um, pair. So um, I think I, I might put Zach and um, Marianne um, and Elsa maybe even on the, on the spotlight here. Does anyone else wanna, I've been talking a lot, does anyone else wanna talk about kind of what we, what our discussion looks like? Everyone's gone back into conference mode, hey? Just sitting and listening. All right. Wait, Elsa, you're you're you've unmuted. Go ahead. Oh dear. Uh, I'm, I I I just wanted to say that I don't know if I feel comfortable enough to present uh, what we uh, what we discussed. So, no, I'd rather leave it to you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. That's fine. All right. Well, I've given you guys a chance. Please weigh in um, as you go. But um, so really from the outcome payers perspective, you know, one of the things that um, we discussed a lot was both the um, the weighing up of both a mission oriented outcome payer as well as a financially aligned outcome payer. So someone like a development finance institution like USAID, who is 
needs to buy these outcomes because um, it's part of what their social contract is. That's what they do is they, you know, create development um, and um, create social environmental outcomes, um, as opposed to potentially a corporate um, or an insurance company um, that is financially incentivized to create these environmental outcomes. Or, um, for instance, a corporate with this large supply chain that would be interested in being able to have the transparency around their supply chain um, from a farming perspective. So it's both of these things and potentially, you know, both and, um, not either or. And so one of the things that you know, we talked about is, as the outcome pair, what, what could, what an idea that could um, work, because one of the things that USAID and other development institutions have is they do have a kind of a set of criteria. And one of the things that we talked about from my experience building outcome-based contracts is that the complexity comes in getting um, the um, different stakeholders around the table to actually come to an agreement because there's so many limitations sitting around the table that finding the section that overlaps can be very difficult. And so one of the things that, you know, that Marianne broke up, brought up was just around wanting a long-term program, like something that was going to be here for a long time. And so we played around a little bit with, you know, would it be something where USAID potentially would be willing to be the payer for a certain period of time with the idea that um, you can, that you would have to over time get additional outcome payers, potentially more financially aligned um, outcome payers um, that would come into this type um, of contract over time. So kind of like a Gabby model where they would essentially fund it over period and then hopefully you would get it to a point where you had kind of um, more financially um, motivated um, outcome payers. And then I think just one last thing that I'll bring up here, obviously we talked about data privacy as well. Um, and that was something really important. So one more thing that we talked about, um, which is important for all of us, I think, is around the contracting of this. Um, and we have in here, you can see the force majeure, um, or what's called a MAC clause, material adverse change clause. And so there's been a lot of interesting work done on the contract of outcome-based um, instruments. And, and one of the pieces um, that is very interesting is around what happens in a time of crisis or when things don't go as you expect them to go. And um, Deborah Baran's done quite a lot of work on this from NYU. And what she's found is that essentially the best way to deal with this is something called inc incomplete contracting, which means you come back to the table. So not every scenario is actually worked out in the contract. And so you're willing to come back to the table to negotiate um, and um, to be able to find something that works for everyone because people's, um, everyone's um, incentives should be aligned to actually creating uh, the impact. So it's something that uh, we have to consider when we think about outcome-based contracting. All right. So we kind of created something, don't you guys think? We have a uh, um, farmers that are able to. There's a bunch of different ways that Hammond um, and your group on impact makers um, created ideas um, that would be able um, to um, use the technology that Monique and Karim and your group um, talked about being able to collect on a regular basis. And I think you know Frederick, this idea of linking it in with blended finance is a great one. Um, I, there's lots of work being done. Um, we're about to start a big project with um, Roots of Impact and UBS on this. I think it's a really Really interesting way to think about, you know, how do we align um, the outcome payers into an investment agreement um, that then aligns the incentives of the investors themselves, um, and that provides from the outcome payers' perspective, you know, the um, trust and the verifiability of um, of what they're actually looking to um, create in the long term. So I think that you know there's there's a lot of ways in what we're talking about to be able to link in multiple different parties and to be able to um, potentially build a structure that allows ongoing impact verification as well as um, the contracting, the financial contracting um, to make money flow. Before I turn it over to Krim to wrap us up quickly, um, I'd love to hear from anyone else. Um, anything that you took away from this, uh, questions that you still have that you know haven't been answered from this? Yeah, I, I mean, from I think that the 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 the, um, the suggestion to to ensure that blended 
finance is flowing as verification is done is a very good one. Uh, and that ties into the suggestion that's, that was made uh, in our session that farmers must be given quick wins and not wait until the end uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the period to, to deliver the, the payment to them. So, so that's, that's what I took away from, uh, from this one. So good job, impact investors. <laughs> and outcome payers and verifiers. Yes. What else? <laughs> Yeah, I think this uh, this notion that you need to be able to again this 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 platform model, not the platform as in an IT platform, but a platform business model where different interests on both sides at community level, but also different profiles of investor from institutional to donors come together in ways that are more seamless is crucial to us cracking this thing in an efficient way, especially because we're talking about not only the different types of investment, but the different investment cycles and periods of time that you're going to need to sustain change over time. So if we're able to find smarter ways of collaborating that don't involve massive MOUs and contracting and agreements and endless conferences uh, for different institutions to collaborate, then I think we'll have done a great thing as well. Annie, if I just could add, and uh, thank you so much for having me in this uh, workshop. And it was actually Frederick amazing uh, uh, doing the um, moderation of it. And I was just very inspired because uh, we are we are working right now in in the cacao industry in Colombia, supporting ex cocaine producers and war victims. And one of the things that we approached was to actually invest in giving them and a smartphone with a platform that allow us to lay down the foundation so that in the future, these producers can have easier way to collaborate with stakeholders like USAID or with investors. And how do we aggregate them digitally so we could reduce some of the cost of operation, the risk. But what is most important, what you just, uh, uh, what I just heard from Monica, it is how can we create a decentralized system where you know where we reduce some of those risk of like I don't want to share data because this is a, we don't want to share this and uh, how do we create something that is a little bit more uh, traceable, transparent, but mostly that allow us to forge uh, trust among different stakeholders and that at the end can benefit not only the producers for sure, but obviously also how we do business as investors, as a DFIs, and certainly as a, a local partners. So thank you so much, very inspiring. Sounds like you've got a perfect platform to use it. What else, anyone else take anything away? Yeah, yes, uh, sorry, um, can I speak? Of course, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I also took something away from, uh, from the verification team um, uh, to the effect that we cannot have a one-size-fits-all uh, and therefore there's a, there is a need for us to create various um, verification uh, requirements uh, across that gradient for, for, various, um, for various constituents. So, so that, that's, a, that's a very good one that, that I took away. And also from um, the... Uh, the outcome payers team, uh, forward contracts or forward agreements uh, was a very good one, which I took away. So bravo everyone. Excellent. Yeah, I think there's, I think there's also um, something that, um, this is something, Hammond said something to me the other day actually, uh, but that's, I, I think it's also come up here is that we can start layering financial instruments as well, because if we feel like there's a payout for a final impact, we can start pre-financing impact to, finer, to, to farmers and, and, and uh, kind of, so carbon bartering or, or whatever uh, mechanism <laughs> you want to call it. So they start getting uh, a kind of you know, immediate uh, pre-finance to adopt the practices that will generate the impact. You can start combining these instruments in ways that will really create interesting propositions across stakeholders without just one stakeholder having to be involved. If you can find different ways of putting together uh, the pieces of a puzzle, that could be really interesting as well. Environmental invoice factoring. Yes, <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, great, Karim, do you want to wrap us up? Sure, thanks, Ani. So yeah, I really enjoyed the discussion um, and certainly 
Um, hopefully you found this format refreshing. I know uh, several of you enjoyed this. It's something that Ani and I have used in, in our teaching recently. We think it's much better than your standard kind of panel um, you know, discussion where you're talked at in this way, hopefully as Sergio, you, you described, right? You could see how this could be adapted to your own um, work and, and you are part of the solution. So maybe just a couple of kind of um, higher level comments you know, back to the theme that we were we were starting with around why pay for performance is exciting. We know the status quo doesn't necessarily work as well. There's the opportunity to be a bit more efficient and, and effective, um, you know, get more impact for your dollar or shilling, align incentives, improve transparency. We hear all of these things, right? But when we talk about what it means in practice, this is exactly the kind of discussion we just had. And so some takeaways are, you know, Hammond, as you, you reiterated from, you know, what Monique was saying, there are different configurations of verification. Um, and there's also in these kinds of um, collaboratives, different enabling conditions. So we have to be clear around what is it that we're actually solving for, what we think good enough looks like. And then the opportunity again, to bring those ethical principles at each stage of the design process in the way that we did today. Um, if you think about putting the lens of the farmer or a community at each stage of design so that in a sense, empowerment is the goal. It's not just a byproduct. You know, in our group, we talked a lot about trust as well. You know, sometimes that is seen to be a, a thing that happens after. You know, after you do this well and make all the mistakes and et cetera, then there will be more trust. But if you design with trust in mind, it completely changes the way perhaps everything happens. And so I think that that's actually quite encouraging um, that I think all the groups talked about that. Of course, there's complexity in terms of all the things we talked about, different kinds of data, um, et cetera, different stakeholders, we saw that play out today. And I think one lesson though is that each of us probably could better now appreciate what others might be designing for. Um, and, and you know, when you look at instruments or tools and, and see that perhaps they're incomplete or don't account for things, it's because perhaps some of the sharing hasn't occurred in the way that we, we tried to almost role play out. So I think one message perhaps is that um, as impact investors more broadly are recognizing that they need to be aware of and account for both positive and negative impacts, part of how we have to be better around is designing processes like this. So that as we think about what each stakeholder would optimize for, what they think good enough looks like, that essentially they have the opportunity to come together before a design is finalized or before governance structures are, are finalized. And so when verification regimes, you know, are actually designed to include community at the front end, I think it's quite exciting. And Sergio, you pointed this out that the opportunity to strengthen trust itself, I guess, could be quite transformative if you build it in right from the beginning. So I think it's quite exciting. This I know is, is a much different discussion than we've had five years ago when we talk about pay for performance, where it was all about the structures and the financing and all of the stuff that made it less accessible to community. And I think this kind of discussion, hopefully, it, you know, shows that we've, we've moved, I think, past that, or at least moved a lot forward compared to five years ago. So maybe Ani, that, that's it for me. Excellent, thanks. Rebecca, is there anything that you would like to add? No, I just wanted to add that um, we had some questions in the chat about you know following up with um, the recording of this. And if anyone is interested in getting the slides that we put together and uh, as a group that we filled in, um, we don't have a way of from this presentation of getting your contact. So if, if you're interested in it, um, please kind of drop your contacts in the chat or you can come by Solidarity. It also has a booth. Um, and so you can leave contact information there. And so, uh, yeah, I see you've, you've pasted it on in there as well. Excellent. And thanks everyone. I, uh, I appreciate the, uh, the time and energy of participating in a, in a workshop format versus I think a lot of people kind of log on just thinking they can listen in. So thank you for the time and effort of doing that. Excellent. Yes, I agree. I think there was a few startled people when they came in and they were all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, we had some people probably <laughs> go right back out and then join back in, so. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, thank you guys so much and thank you um, Rebecca and Libby for all the work that you did put together um, and I hope everyone else has a great rest of SOCAP and we will see you soon. See you soon everybody. Thanks, Thanks for listening in. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for joining. <laughs>